This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, July 21st from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. Reynoldsburg, Ohio. I'm CJ Huxley. Wait, uh, wait. Where's Gavin? He's not there. Where, where's... Uh. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast about home automation, home technology, home automation, and... Uh, yeah, Gavin's, Gavin's not going anywhere. He's, he just had something else going on tonight. We Tonight's the night we can record this week, so TJ is here. Yay! Yeah, I mean, sometimes you have a life, and podcasting doesn't fit into that all the time, and, and that's fine. You know, I've been miss, missing from the podcast a couple times, and Seth doesn't because Seth kind of runs the podcast. So if Seth is missing, I don't, I don't think we have a podcast. You guys could figure out how to record and do, like, show notes and all that stuff, right? You could do that, right? I mean, we could literally do the same exact thing. We just don't i think we use you as an excuse so it's like ah well you know the main person's not here so i guess we can't do anything uh you have a login to the same thing i do you could just log in and record <laughs> well, we're not we don't use anything special so i mean we could literally just you know do it over a zoom call or something like we do now and and, and do it right. but we just don't i guess yeah it's okay it's okay and gavin it's okay, it's okay. yeah we like you seth gavin actually had a bunch of updates too so like he's, he's missing out more i think than anybody else uh, because he's been like tinkering around with things. I'm not going to tell you what the, like, I guess he talked about last week that he was buying a 3D printer. And uh, yeah, that that has come into full effect. He's already printed like an entire house worth of stuff to play with. So I remember I remember, I remember getting my first 3D printer. You know, you just start printing everything that you possibly can. And, you know, I ran into the problem where I was printing so many things that I needed to get like a secondary printer. So, you know, maybe it, it, it's kind of like a gateway drug. Uh, but you know, for printers, well, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't ever think, I don't think I'll have that problem because I don't think I'm going to like run out and grab a 3d printer anytime soon. Maybe, maybe one day, but well, I think you have to have some like spare time. And I, for some reason, Seth, I feel like you don't have a lot of spare time. <laughs> Not these days. And so maybe a 3d printer probably isn't a good investment for you. No, no. I have a bunch of like things I have to do around the house and 3d printer is probably not one of them. Yeah. Gavin's like an it person. So, I mean, he literally does nothing all day. He can play with this 3d printer. <laughs> exactly. What, is, what does <laughs> it do? <laughs> Uh, that's too good, too good. Well, speaking of people that don't really do anything, um, you were gone over the last week, and you, you you were in a different location again. You weren't in Ryan's, Ryan Reynoldsburg. You were in someplace in Illinois, and you were Naperville. Yeah, that the the place that has uh, Adam Justice there and his home, and in, also his home theater. And you were making it, and there is a full episode already published, episode two nineteen. Let's build a home theater part four of the smart home show. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Go listen to that. Uh, fun. You guys had some fun, man. You, you had a lot of fun. It sounds like, well, you forgot about the other person that was there, Seth. And that oh, yeah, is Richard, was there uh, Richard yeah. Gunther. I mean, uh, that guy, that guy was like famous. Everybody knows him, but it, it's very, it, it was very good to me. Adam, I've known Adam for a couple of years, you know, via the Slack and stuff like that. I feel like I've known Richard though, for like a decade and we've never met. Because I've followed Richard on various platforms, you know, he's annoyed Richard and a couple other things on Twitter. And so I've just it was it was nice meeting everybody in person for the first time. And uh, we installed a home theater. How is that possible? I I have pictures of you guys in the same room. So. It's really? Just, yeah, I don't think maybe so. I just have a really bad memory, which is very possible <laughs> and, and slightly true. But I don't I feel like I haven't met Richard before. It's a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Like, I think it, at Cedia and. Um, well, I went to Cedia for a little bit, so it was in San Diego. I'm pretty sure at the home. Yeah, I had to leave early, but I mean, it's very possible. I have, I have a very poor memory, so. <laughs> But he he didn't think we met each other either. So at least, you know, if, if we did, it, w- it wouldn't be awkward for me. But no, I went to uh, I went to Naperville. We hung out at Adam's house and installed his home theater. Um, I have to tell you, Seth, those SVS subs, the the in-wall subs are amazing. They are so big and just uh, they create so much space. It is crazy. And so if you haven't listened to the the previous episodes, we've done four parts with the Smart Home Show with Richard, um, Adam, Owen and Seth and I. And we talked about the home theater that Adam is building. Um, it's uh, what a 7.2.2 Dolby Atmos setup with a really the, the Sony 7000 series projector. The image is fantastic. It's a 145 inch display. 
Um, and it, it just sounds amazing. I mean, I know that, you know, projectors are nice. And especially when you buy like one of the really nice ones, it looks good. But the audio is really spectacular in that room. And it's not even like adjusted or anything yet. So like there's not any carpet yet. There's no furniture. Um, we kind of installed everything with the intention of uh, taking a lot of it down. And so we couldn't actually adjust the volume and, and fine tune and everything. But it just it just sounds so good. And I, I, I cranked it up and we were listening to it, you know, in the upstairs <laughs> and uh, you could you could feel the little rumbles and stuff like that. But they did a really good job with soundproofing. And so it's honestly not too bad. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, I, it was good. To, it was good to hear like all of the things that I mean, you had a bunch of things on the show. I'm not going to go too much into it. You had a bunch of things that like didn't happen exactly as they should, of course, because it's construction, right? Like that's never you're, you're never going to have a construction project that like everything's ready to go the day it's supposed to be going. I, I've never seen that happen. Um, and so you, you were actually fighting the like painting needed to be done. Things like small things like painting and flooring and that kind of thing. Still not done, but you, you may do. And you guys had got what done, what you could get done once it all gets dialed in and everything. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty, pretty nice room, especially when you add carpet and, and, and mm-hmm. uh, seating in there, that's going to change that room dramatically like padding carpet that's gonna be huge yeah yeah that was kind of the only disappointing thing about the whole project is that i haven't been able to see it completed yet because a lot of times when i get in the situation like they might not have furniture and stuff in there but at least they at least have the, the carpet and the ceiling and the lighting and stuff like that done and so you get everything installed and, and you watch a, a tv show or a movie or something like that and you, and you start getting the full effect um, I kind of miss that from this job, though, because it's, you know, we're watching something in an unfinished basement um, and it's just, you know, it's not the same effect. So I, I miss that part of it. But it was really cool to uh, get together with everybody and and build a really cool theater. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was laughing at one of the things and I I know you were you were posting about this and in, in when we were talking about it, but I didn't put like two and two together like that. You had purchased a projector and it didn't come with the ceiling mount part. And I'm like. I was listening back to that and you said that you had bought a chief mount and it didn't come with the top mm-hmm. part where you touched the ceiling. I'm like, oh man. And you guys like drove all around trying to find like a part for that. You could have, you you could have gotten, I mean, it's, it's MPT, right? So it, you could have just gotten an MPT like fixture from Home Depot for like $3. But no, nobody had anything in stock. I'm not even exaggerating. Stuff. <laughs> like uh, I looked at hardware stores. I looked at like ADI. I looked at Best Buy. I looked at all these stores and literally nobody had it. Oh. Um, and it, it just it, it sucked because like my distributor had it in stock. And if we had an extra day, like I could have just got it shipped in and everything would have been fine. But like we like I think we found out Thursday. And I was like, well, I'm leaving tomorrow, so I, I that's not going to work. Right, right, right. And so and it's, and it's my fault in the grand scheme of things. You know, when you buy a projector mount, um, it, it usually doesn't come with the ceiling bracket because they don't know what exactly you're going to be using. And so, like, that was totally my oversight. But it just it stinks because it could have easily been corrected with enough time. But instead, we had to buy a five hundred dollar kit that came with everything when we needed like a twenty dollar part. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, that, so that does. Now I, now I have an extra projector mount. Oh, so. well, congratulations. Uh, that means that means you know what that means. You got to make another theater. That's that's this. right. <laughs> Who wants a theater? I got the parts. I was listening to that. and I'm like, oh, he just needed like a like just a, a standard MPT one and one half inch MPT pipe threat. Like you can you can buy them like the little things that like, yeah. usually at Home Depot or or even like you yep. can go down to a like a fire uh, company, like what are they called? The fire, uh, like a, a, a place that does fire alarms and that kind of thing. They, they usually have parts and pieces for pipe. Uh, that sucks, man. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it happens. Uh, another thing I want to call it, though, is uh, the have you ever used one of the Anthem receivers, Seth? Uh, I have used Anthem amplifiers, like the whole house audio amplifiers, and they are sweet. OK, so I have a feeling the receivers are just as good. Oh my gosh. The receiver was so nice. I mean, so I, I forget which exact model. I think it was like an MRX 1140 or something like that. It's like an AK uh, 11 channel receiver. Um, but it, the display on it's just so nice. You know, if you've used a lot of AV receivers in the past, traditionally you can only see like one or two lines of text. And so you're going through there and it's like, oh, I got to adjust the speakers and you got to go through like one line item at a time to figure out where the speakers are. Or, and then, or, or you don't have, a, a video path going from the receiver. Like the receiver is just doing audio 
And the video path goes a different direction for video processing, right? So there may not be an OSD like on the screen and like you all you have is that little one line thing, right? Like there's no there's no way to see anything about that one line. Yeah. So not you don't have that problem with uh, with the Anthem, though, because it's got a nice big display on there and you can literally see every option on the same screen, Seth. It's so nice. And it's like it's like a five thousand dollar receiver. Like, you know, there, it's not a cheap receiver by any means, but it, it's just it's very nice to use. And it feels like a premium device. Like even if you spent five thousand dollars on a Yamaha receiver or like a Denon, like it's going to feel all right. But I, I feel like it's not going to be anything like this. I'm looking at the pictures on their website and they don't really indicate that you have that screen to go off because it's just got like the big negative thirty five decibels on it or whatever. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. When you go into like the menu, it just shows everything. So, but yeah, just it's it's a nice receiver. And I tried to become a dealer for them, but they said there was too many dealers in our area. So, yeah, they don't want you. I guess not. That's how it is. Yeah, I've used the MDX 16, I guess, maybe the MDX 8. I'm not sure. It's a whole house audio amplifier that they have. Um, Had way more options than I expected it to have when I was putting it in. Worked really well. And they've got that little um, uh, kind of the same, probably they probably have the same thing that you have for the theater where you plug a little microphone into the computer. It has some mm-hmm. software that kind of does all the same so you go thing. into the room and you say, okay, EQ this room and it plays some sounds out the speakers and it will EQ that room. So I thought that was pretty cool. Arc. Arc is what they call it. Yeah. Auto room correction, I think, or something like that. Anthem room Anthem correction. Room but we correction, can call correction, it yeah. auto because it's probably, yeah. you know, yeah. Why not? <laughs> tomato, tomato. Yeah, exactly. It, they, they put a little microphone included in the box. And then what will happen is the homeowner gets all you know feisty and they, they just throw the microphone away. So you never get to do that part of the project. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. Love it when that happens. It's like, oh, I threw all that way stuff away from you. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh it's too bad. Guess what? <laughs> it's going to sound weird in here. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, anyway, that it sounded like it was a, a lot of fun. Um, I, I especially like some of the pictures that you sent where like Adam and Richard were putting together the... Uh, the screen and like working <laughs> on that together. It's like every everybody's pitching in to get this to get this theater up and going. Well, yeah, because you know when if you listen to the show, we go a little more in depth than that, and it'll we'll link it in the show notes there. But we basically lost like two days or one and a half days or something like that. And so like I had like a heart to heart, and I was like, look, you know, I basically I need you guys to build the screen and install it tomorrow so that I can keep doing stuff, and then we can actually watch something. And so Richard and Adam definitely helped put the screen together. They got it all installed and everything. And I'm glad they did because they realized how much uh, Snap AV sucks at directions and like making products in general because they've had this acoustic <laughs> weave screen for like ever now. But they have they have this. Uh, first of all, the measurement between the two brackets that you have to snap onto the wall are like some weird measurement of like, you know, eighty five point five seven millimeters. And I. I don't know who's able to just measure that out with whatever they have in their bag. I, I'm glad you had to go grab that specifically, though. <laughs> Seth, is, Seth, for those not watching the video, Seth is showing me a, a millimeter uh, tape measure, which eight meter tape measure. He, you can go buy these eight, eight meter, 26 foot, which he Home probably Depot. bought like five years ago. And he's used it like twice for weird situations like this. No, no. Here's the thing. If you bring this onto a job site, no one will touch it. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I don't know what that is, <laughs> but anyway, the, numbers. The, the screen's got or the screen's bracket has some like weird measurement between them. And then there's like this black fabric that goes on after the screen to like hide everything that's behind the screen. So, you know, that your speakers and everything. But there's literally no way to attach the black fabric to anything that the screen comes with. Mm. And so like before I've kind of like tucked it in or I've like got a piece of cardboard and jammed it underneath there. This time I got some magnets and I just attached it to the frame. And that seemed to do all right. Yeah. But it's just weird that this, you know, three or four thousand dollar screen literally comes with no directions on how to attach this important piece of black fabric. Interesting. Hmm. Well, I mean, they're not they're not exactly known as being I mean, it's kind of like the Amazon basics of and I, I don't want to say that in a mean way. Like you can get a lot <laughs> done with Amazon basics. Right. But like their, their products Ouch, are kind of snap. AV is crying right now. <sighs> I mean, it's it's the reputation they have. It's not on me to change that, right? But maybe include directions on how to have the black fabric cinched up, or maybe include the magnets that TJ you know doesn't have to go steal off Adam's refrigerator. Yeah, I think they cost me like ten dollars at Home Depot Snap AV, so you can just you can go get them probably in bulk and spend like fifty cents, maybe seventy five cents. 
I mean, it's pretty easy to do. You should go ahead and just do a snap baby. Thank you. Well, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those, like, um, it's also one of those things that you as an installer kind of know about inherently like, Oh, this is going to come up. So I have a solution for this one particular product. And, and I don't think that mm-hmm. is all snap AV. Like I installed a lot of high end products where there was always some kind of like, Oh yeah, I don't use, I don't do that here. I have to wrap this around over here and do it this way because you know, it, it, it as, as much as this uh, high end speaker company thinks this is going to work, it's never going to work this way. So I, I totally, I totally get it, but it, it also kind of like comes with the territory of being a custom integrator where you have to make things custom work, right? Yeah, we're just making it up every day. So <laughs> yeah, if you see your local AV integrator out in a bar, buy him a drink because he's probably upset about what he's installing. Or he could be working there. So let's just check first. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we let's move on here. Uh, it sounds like you guys have a lot of fun. I it was a super insane, busy week for me. I couldn't get away to to come visit and play up in Chicago land. Um, would have been fun to to have a whole the whole group there. Uh, my, minus Owen, but would have been nice. Um, but I think I think they were talking about getting another show put together, like a part five or something later on down the road. Maybe when everything's all finished off and Adam can kind of explain what's happened over over the past couple of months and when everything's kind of finally gets part uh, pieced together <laughs> uh, I, I i hear that he has some furniture to move from his basement or something all the way or no no from like upstairs all the way down to the basement yeah from his garage down to the basement the, the giant theater chairs so he was like yeah we'll start working on moving that and i was like i would definitely be hiring movers for that i am leaving <laughs> <laughs> i am not a mover sorry no, and honestly, minus Owen, we'll all be together during Cedia in two months, basically. So I know Adam and Richard will be there. You, me, and Gavin will be there. It is roughly, yeah, it's roughly two months, two months away. It, it, well, in two months, two months from now, we'll already be back. So yeah, it's about a, it's about a month away because it's September seventh, eighth, and ninth. I guess is the show. Mm, I will yeah. be there starting uh, the sat- the third because uh, I have a booth to set up that gets installed on the fourth, and from the fifth, sixth, and seventh, I will be pulling my hair out trying to get uh, whatever technology stuff we have in that booth working. <laughs> Should be fun. <laughs> Are you going to have your new Wi-Fi system by then, or are you just going to put that off till next year? Uh, I I think we, we will have it. I'm pretty sure we will. It depends on, like, what we show. Yeah, I, th- I think we'll probably have it. Um, the little cellular wi- uh, Wi-Fi thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we can buy the, the internet early on, and it's a little bit cheaper, but it's still absurd for how many how much they charge for the whole thing. Oh, so. yeah. 100%. I think within, like, two shows, you it would, we'd pay basically for Basically do two shows, Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Two trade shows and you're good. Ridiculous. I think I, I think I posted those prices to you guys. Like, I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. Look at this. <laughs> like yeah. They, they are just insane on in how much they charge for everything. So, yeah. should We should have a crazy booth, though. That, that'll that be fun. Um, I was trying to line up a video wall and the price came in like it. <laughs> Never mind. $30,000 for a video wall. Oh, that's it? Yeah. It's advertising, I mean, I, though. I, I will get it a lot cheaper, uh, but uh, it it... It definitely was the, actually the only thing that, that caused me to say no to it was the time frame. They needed a decision sometime today, an PO and a, and a check to get the manufacturing started and to bring it over and deliver it within the time frame that we needed. And I'm like, the time frame that they would have gotten this massive video all to us would have been like on August 16th or something like that. So th- they they were actually going to move quite quite fast to make that happen say, that's pretty quick yeah yeah I, it was like not freight it was gonna be like air delivered and stuff like that um but the 14th 15th and 16th are when they're dry fitting the booth together and putting on the final finishes and i think the 17th and 18th they really want to be packing that thing up and <laughs> it's for me to show up with a 250 pound video wall <laughs> and say let's try this out uh that's probably not going to work so yeah it's got to be shipped uh, deliver, you know, two weeks on freight to be delivered at the Cedia thing warehouse or wherever the the show floor in time. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of coordination that goes on with this thing. And I'm glad that um, we're paying people that are not me to do it because I am not good at that. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Not me. 
Anyway, let's move on here. Uh, we, we've got a couple of home he- headlines, uh, a couple of small pieces of news that came up that uh, we can go over. So uh, what do you say we get to it? Let's do it. So we got, we've got a follow up about Blue Iris. Uh, they, they, we talked about them a little bit last week. There was something going on with their website and uh, kind of crashed and there was a bunch of licensing questions. But I guess they released a um, I don't know if this is a full Porsche modem on like what happened, but like it, something happened and they said our web server used for this site, the forum and licensing had a meltdown on July 7th and the hard drive was completely unrecoverable. Unfortunately, we discovered that regular backups had been failing. So we had to resort to quite an old backup just to get things uh, going back online. Rest assured that this process will be revamped and now closely monitored. <laughs> Blue Iris is a very small company and uh, let's see, and we wear many hats, some of which fit better than others. Uh, this was not a server or database, quote, going down that caused the licensing issues. Uh, it was when it all came back online from an older restore point than we would have liked. So, yeah, um, I guess, you know, if you bought a license, it wasn't in that database because it was a, an older restore point. And when your server thing checked in or your blue iris checked in, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, you don't have a license and kicked you back out. Not good, but I don't know. I, I kind of look at this as somebody who has to deal with computers every day and web servers and say, yeah, well, I, I get it. I could see it happening. Yeah, I mean, it kind of seems like a legitimate thing. I mean, I don't use Blue Iris and I have nothing in the fight here. But I mean, the reasoning seems legit. I think a lot of people are just upset because, first of all, it happened. And so this, you know, supposedly local only or, or local primarily service was suddenly locked out. And especially if it was a remote, you know, server where maybe you didn't have access to and, and everything like that, like that would absolutely suck. Um, and I think the other issue was that they just didn't respond fast enough and let people know that. And so a lot of people had those issues and had nowhere to talk and had nowhere to go to. And then that just made everybody upset even more. So, well, I mean, you know, I, I, I could totally see that. Like, oh, for they're, sure. Yeah, they're they're They've got a melted, you know, hard drive that's just completely gone or something's gone wrong. And they're trying to like, OK, we'll just recover from this backup that's sitting right here on my desk. Oh, no. <laughs> then yeah. you're like, oh, no. What, what, you know, then you're you're going to the next backup and like, OK, does that work? No. Then you're the next step. So, um, you know, this is this is one of those learning process things. It, it'll probably never happen to this company again. <laughs> it's, it's one could ha- hope. One can hope. I mean, so the thing about backups, though, is like you have to test them. Like you can't just like back up into the blind. I ran into this one time with a computer that I had backing up and it turns out my backups, I had a deleted file that I really like a whole directory of files that I needed. And when I ran my backup, those files had been deleted on the backup (laughs) and there was no backup of the backup, you know? So like I actually had to find them a different way. And I, I think uh, the previous backup that I had made online, like to the online backup was a week behind or something like that. And it, it was, it was, it basically missed like four or five files that out of the whole hard drive that I really needed back, like four or five files missing, not the end of the world. Right. So like you definitely have to have a backup plan, but then you have to test it. And that obviously wasn't happening here, but you know, they'll, they'll make it. there was a lot of like, uh, if you go to the post and kind of look through the comments there's a lot of like um, what Monday morning quarterbacking going on. Like, oh, why didn't you do this, that, and that? But like, I think it says it right there in the little statement. Blue Iris is a very small company. <laughs> like, they sell a twenty-five dollar DIY NVR solution to that competes heavily with like NVRs and and recorders that cost thousands of dollars, right? So like, you you kind of getting what you paid for, unfortunately, right? Like maybe it's seventy-five dollars. I don't know. To me, small company, I, I don't know that you can expect much more out of them like this. And they're probably running their own server and didn't expect a hard drive to crash. Yeah, you're kind of screwed either way. You go with the big company and you get all your information stolen or you go with a small company and you have weird issues like this. So you kind of have to pick your poison and figure out which product works best for you. And, you know, technology is complicated. It doesn't matter if you're a giant company or a small company. Technology is always going to be complicated and there's always going to be issues. Yeah. Or you go with the big company. And uh, they're like, well, that product was discontinued three years ago. <laughs> Sorry, we Sorry. have this new one for five thousand dollars. Yeah, there you go. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, I, I think for the value that they offer for the twenty-five or seventy-five dollars, what are the little licenses for Blue Iris, like full license thing that they offer? I think it, 
as much as I like not don't really care about the software because it's it, it's so so there's so many settings, CJ. Like price per setting, Blue Iris has everybody <laughs> hand down. It's the best value on the market, but like they have, you can tell there's a lot of like um, work that's gone into that product, and like it's it doesn't cost much, and you can run it on a wide variety of soft hardware. So that, that's that's pretty good in, in my book, especially for what is clearly a small company. It's not like it's giant corporation trying to respond to their server going down on. And I just checked Friday, Friday, July seventh. <laughs> like, that's the worst time. The guy's probably out out to <laughs> dinner and he's like. What are all these text messages coming in for? Why why are, why are people freaking Let's out? Let's go ahead and just ignore that for right now. <laughs> yeah, mute. I'm at the movies. <laughs> I was looking so. at the uh, the Blue Iris pricing, and it's a little weird in my opinion, but the full version, which supports up to 64 cameras, is $80, and that's a lifetime, so it's not a monthly or yearly fee or anything like that. But then they have an LE version, which supports one camera for $40. You're kind of incentive to, to, to buy. To <laughs> yeah, you might as well just buy the full version. I mean, what are you going to buy one camera for? But $80. I mean, that's not bad. It's a lifetime. You don't have to mess with it ever again. You're going to have weird stuff happen once in a while. Though. Yeah, it's software. I mean, look there for a little while. Facebook couldn't even get into their own building because their server went down. <laughs> So, I mean, like technology breaks for all kinds of people. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, best of luck to them getting back online. I really, you know, some of the comments and, and of course, the Reddit thread uh, were just a little bit over the top. And, you know, I I, no, not Reddit. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's backup. We, We have all been in this situation and like, you know, small company like. Forgive and forget, and uh, hopefully they learn the lesson. If you know, if they do it again, like in in like three more weeks, if the server goes down, <laughs> all right. Well, then probably they're probably done for. And they're like, oh yeah, we we didn't. Snap AV is gonna buy them. <laughs> this backup solution that we had just didn't work. Yeah, then that that's when you start looking elsewhere for your eighty dollars software. Um, but I think for now, I think you're pretty safe in their hands. All right, let's move on here. Uh, this this is more of a follow up too. I I I really. I didn't catch this in Apple's keynote and they really don't talk about what they're doing in HomeKit or what they're doing in the home app very often. But I guess there's been some updates. Uh, of course, the, the beta is going on right now for for um, I- iOS 17, iPad OS 17 and TV OS 17. Of course, it's all 17s, uh, but it's got a couple of uh, new smart home features. And one of them that really caught my eye was uh, you will now be able to access your smart home's activity history for the last 30 days. You can view release and activity for garage doors and security systems and use interactive widgets from the home or lock screen to, to see them. So I, I, you know, that, that right there is a core feature that I have here on my um, Gavin recommended uh, was home assistant. Like it, it's, I think the whole thing is built around data and graphs and all that stuff. Uh, home kit, yeah, you're lucky to look at a dashboard and see the device that you're looking for, like to find out if it's on or off. Now you get 30 days of history to find out that the light, you know, I'm just I'm saying this laughing because my daughter's door is opening and closing. Right now. <laughs> so I'll be able to like make a, you know, look at the history of it opening and closing every nice night. Nice little graph. You yeah, know? yeah. Is that so? Well, I don't know. This is this is nice. It's it's nice to f- this is, seems like a kind of a geeky thing, but it, at the same time, for like things like security, garage doors, and stuff, sometimes you want to know. Like, did I get a notification for that for an opening? Like, what? What? I don't remember what happened last Thursday or whatever. And you go back and and see that history. I, I think it's kind of nice. Yeah, it's kind of weird uh, to me. It's kind of weird that it wasn't uh, included initially. I mean, I just I feel like history is such a big important thing for me. Because I, I like to go back and see like when the lights turned on or, or uh, if somebody came in at a certain time or or whatever. So it, it's cool they're adding this feature, but it's a little perplexing that it, it took this long for for my opinion. Yeah, the, the, I think there were some and I know there was a third party logging utility app that you could you could get. Um, and, and the problem was you had to have like a you had to have a device like running all the time to basically log it. It, it wasn't ideal. So I'm glad that they're finally putting some of this, some of those features in to make it native because it, that that's not optimal <laughs> to have just an iPad. Oh, that's my logging iPad. It's logging all the door. No, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Launching my home assistant to make sure my graphs are okay this week. I don't think there's any updates. So I oh, don't say that. 
Oh, yeah, I haven't updated in two weeks. No, there's updates. Come on. Oh, man. Yeah, you definitely <laughs> haven't updated them. <laughs> All right, we'll get to that later in the show. But uh, uh, there, there is a, a new Wi-Fi standard out there. Uh, Wi-Fi's groundbreaking concept of wireless internet has evolved with the introduction of Li-Fi, now a standardized technology known as a- IEEE 802.11bb. Li-Fi utilizes light as a medium for data transfer instead of radio waves, offering advantages like higher bandwidth, reduced interference, and enhanced security. (laughs) I wonder how that could be. Uh, Companies like Pure Li-Fi and Fraunhofer HHI are at the forefront of this Li-Fi development. And while it won't replace Wi-Fi anytime soon, it can excel in scenarios where Wi-Fi is weak or unavailable, like hospitals or airplanes. Places like that. Standard also allows devices to seamlessly switch back and forth between Wi-Fi and Li-Fi networks. It's really fun to say. Uh, for optimal connectivity. As Li-Fi gains traction, hopefully we can expect to see more light-based internet applications in the coming years. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, interesting idea here. I think I, I know that way back, way back, Jason and I talked about these kind of technologies like coming on the market. And I want to say... Pure Li-Fi was probably something we talked about way back then. That that name seems kind of familiar, but it, now it's a standard. So maybe we'll start seeing more devices. Yeah, I, I I don't really understand why, and I don't really understand their explanation or their scenarios like a hospital, because wouldn't you still have to install like a device in the hallway or the room or whatever that transmits this? So I guess what's the advantage over regular wi-fi other than bandwidth it seems like bandwidth is the the most eh, i mean applicable reason i guess yeah you would still need it, it uses some kind of like led light to basically blink on and off really fast <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just do what you expect <laughs> uh to basically transfer the data why is everything strobing yeah yeah it says they're using visible infrared and ultraviolet light so yeah it could be like a real flashy flashy light type thing hmm yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what the 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 like hospital. The only thing I can think of like a hospital or airplane is like maybe radio waves aren't ideal um, for, oh, in yeah. some locations. So maybe maybe that maybe for those kind of devices. That makes sense. Like a like a uh, scanner or something like that. Right. I mean, I know that like for both of those industries, there are like extreme amounts of testing and vetting for equipment like in application like things that they have to go through so maybe it makes sense in in those in those couple of places i, I don't know it, it, it is a standard 802.11 bb um so now that it's kind of gained that standard these companies that are making these devices supposedly might be able to kind of just work off of it and rather than make two competing standards that are proprietary you know so that'll be that'll be it's it says their security is it, the security is like well Here's how you secure this room. You just close this door, <laughs> <laughs> which I find hilarious. I find absolutely hilarious. It's like, well, that that is that is security, I guess. If you can't see the light, then it's your data That's is secure. Right. You can't tell what it is until they come out with like a sniffer or something. And it's like, well, actually, the uh, the sniffer can detect little micro changes in the atmosphere. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, listen like- to exactly what you're asking for. <laughs> You you wouldn't have like any bleed between rooms though. Like if you needed Wi Fi in this room, you, there's no channel overlap. You just close the door. There's it's no true. channel overlap. I'm just imagining like the tech support calls though. Like you you get this set up in like an office for somebody's laptop or desktop, and you get a call and it's like my desktop doesn't work with the internet. And you're like, oh okay, well, you know, have you restarted it? Have you you know done this? Have you done that? Yeah yeah, nothing's working. And then you get there and there's like a plant on top of the computer and it's just blocking all the light. <laughs> <laughs> no internet for you i i, I was kind of thinking of like the the opposite of that like um you know how you have those little like switch guards for your philips hue lights like mm-hmm. you, you would need that like do you turn the light off oh i turned the light off the internet's <laughs> down oh i shouldn't have done that yeah i guess we'll wait to see what happens with it but right now i i don't see the point in it but it's a still a very new technology so it might have a purpose. It might matter more than matter at some point. <laughs> it might. It might. I'm looking at their website. And so they've got they've got some they're just like con- conceptual products for what they can they can do. Uh, and there, there's there's different modules that you can get based on the application. And the, yeah, one of this is interesting. It's like a it's called a Li-Fi Halo. And it's basically a, um, you know, like a it's not reality, uh, augmented reality or um, what is the other one? 
where you like there there's no augmentation it's like full in, enclosure reality whatever that is v- vr yeah vr and they call it xr which is really throwing me off it's like xr what is that but oh uh, yeah i think that means both of them now uh okay it's like you know sense. yeah yeah ar and vr yeah that's better better than just saying them both okay all right and then they've got some like uh like little wi-fi bridges for outdoor applications and then like some defense and industrial of course you have to have a defense and industrial if you're doing anything like this you got to have like a tactical version so they got their tactical version it's all beefy it's mission mission deployable a tactical says. wi-fi device yeah yeah so I could see this in like a warehouse or something, maybe where you got like a bunch of handheld scanners or, you know, maybe um, forklifts or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there, there's there's probably good applications for this and then reasons why Wi-Fi isn't great for it as well. Mm-hmm. So we'll have to see how it plays out. And, and it may be that we get on an airplane one day and, you, you know, to get online, you have to turn on your overhead light, you know, and uh the experience will still be awful thanks to uh go go in flight <laughs> 30 dollars for your one hour flight and god forbid there's only five minutes left you got to get online and check something and like oh yeah it's still 30 bucks guys sorry <laughs> we didn't prorate this any for you <laughs> heck no <laughs> oh man too good too good at least it's not convention center wi-fi uh yeah i mean i think it's probably more expensive actually <laughs> i don't know <laughs> at least it works though yeah, I don't better. think I've ever had a problem with uh, in-flight Wi-Fi, but convention convention center Wi-Fi, I always have a problem with. Oh, I've had problems with in-flight Wi-Fi for sure. For sure. That's that's yeah, that, that, there was a nine hour flight. There was like the it just sat there and teased me the whole time. It's like, yeah, just connect to this and you can get online. And I connect to it and I would get to the payment page. And it was like, oh, sorry, we're offline again. It's like, oh, my God, that happened for like three hours. And I'm like, well, finally, I'll just give up on this and just watch these movies over again. Anyway, uh, we got one more thing here. This is kind of interesting. The Biden administration is launching a U.S. cyber trust mark. It's a cybersecurity label for smart devices. It's a voluntary program that will cover various connected devices found in homes, including refrigerators, microwaves, televisions, fitness trackers, and more. Uh, supported companies like Google, Samsung, and Amazon uh, are, 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 are saying they're, they're supporting this initiative and creating a, uh, basically a QR code uh, to beat Security standards based on NIST uh, NIST guidelines. So, uh, what is that? National Institute of Standards and Time. Um, so, there's a logo, a QR code, and you go in there and you kind of look up, I guess, what security uh, what security is built into the products, uh, and uh, it'll help provide consumers with transparency regarding any data collection or security updates that may come from it. So, uh, we I think we we've been talking about this or dreaming about something like this for kind of a long time. Like it's just another government logo to go on there like the fcc logo or the energy star one but i don't know this this is kind of needed i think with iot devices and has been needed for a long time yeah it's really good to see stuff like this i mean i don't know if it will materialize into anything but uh, secure you know iot devices like this should have bare minimum security that we can all rely on and so that way random devices in the world are not becoming part of botnets which then are attacking other people's quality stuff and and taking down websites and everything like that so realistically you would just rely on companies doing the right thing but i think we all know that companies usually do the cheapest thing and not having to deal with security is is definitely the cheapest thing and so until you make standards like this or laws or regulations, then nobody's going to follow them. Yeah. So I, th- I think this is good. We'll see if it actually does anything. Um, it, it's a good idea, in my opinion, though. Yeah, it, it, it says here by scanning the QR code, you will even have more detail on your smartphone. For instance, you'll be able to see how long you can expect to have security updates for your product. We talked about that for, for quite some time. It's like, well, yes, it's expired uh, three years ago. I probably shouldn't have this in my house anymore. Yeah. And you can put active threats on there. Like, you know, this one is, you know, susceptible to this, this and this. You should probably get rid of it. And I think it's interesting in this article, they they make a distinction. They say, you know, separate networking devices like Zigbee and Z-Wave hubs that aren't associated with any one device, though, are instead lumped into the Wi-Fi routers, which weren't examined as part of this report. And so they're they're working on that for the end of 2023. So safe to assume that Wi-Fi routers, Zigbee and Z-Wave hubs are also going to get this this uh, treatment, which is definitely good, in my opinion, because they are Internet connected devices and, and people use them for very important things. And we just can't, you know, 
uh, assume that the average consumer knows what this stuff means. We have to kind of help them with and that. Especially routers. I mean, they're they're like the gateway device, right? So if there's a, a router out there that has some kind of active exploit or, you know, uh, and there's been plenty over time. Like, I think there's like a, a full list of them somewhere like that was that were being hacked. Like the FBI released a, a, a list sometime last year, like a massive amount of routers that were being hacked and just used as, to, to, to basically scam people into paying Bitcoin. Remember Bitcoin? Bitcoin's still around. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Like, this is uh, this is one of those things that'd be good for consumers at the end of the day. It sounds like it sounds like the market's still moving fast enough that the government can't keep up if they forgot about, you know, <laughs> the uh, uh, Zigbee and Z-Wave hubs and routers. Like, uh, they probably, probably should have put that at the top of the list. Well, I think um, they, they gave... IOT devices like a specific uh, label. Uh, Where's that at here? Which I, f- I found kind of interesting. So during the interview, they pointed out the they asked asked the FCC what they will consider an IOT product under the Cyber Trust labeling program, and they said it, any uh, network connected device with a sensor or actuator can be considered an IOT device. While the whole of that device, the associated app, the cloud, backend, and required bespoke hubs is considered the IoT product. And so I find that pretty fascinating that they're actually describing what an IoT product is. I think we've all kind of just made the assumption of what an IoT product is, kind of like um, some other technology things that happen over time. But now we kind of have a definition of what the government considers an IoT device and that's kind of what came out of this as well is those classifications. And so Wi-Fi routers and Zigbee and Z-Wave hubs aren't IoT devices under that standard, but they are, you know, hubs and everything else and they will get their own standard. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. That makes sense. So IoT needs a sensor or actuator. Um, it, it has to do something in, mm-hmm. I guess, I mean, routers and hubs, I guess if you're. They're more like a controller, not necessarily a, a doer. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I would hate to have it like because you have this cyber U.S. cyber trust mark, right? Like you're going to get this logo and that's not going to be on your router, but it's going to be on the sensor and actuator devices that you Mm -hmm. have. But the router is probably controlling them or at least talking to them. Some of these have like border gateways built into them. I'm looking at you. What is that uh, Eero, right? Like so that has a thread border gateway to get you on matter devices. And it's like maybe that should have it on there, too. Maybe it should have it on there. That's right. Nobody will follow it, I'm sure. So. <laughs> it's like, like, like a, lot of, a lot of the other uh, government regulation stuff. It's like, ah, that's cool. And then nobody does. Yeah, it. it's a hot mess. So, well, hopefully yeah. something will good come out of it. And uh, we'll we'll get a, a, another label that everyone will ignore on there. Just like the Energy Standard and Energy Star one and uh, the FCC label that says that it won't, device won't interfere with things. Right. So <laughs> anyway, moving on here. Uh into our Who Matters This Week segment. And this week, guess what, TJ? It's Leviton. They have added Matter support to four of the Decora Smart Lighting products. Uh, the DS, uh, no, sorry, D215S Smart Switch, the D26HD Smart Dimmer, the D215P Smart Plug, the D23LP Mini Plug Dimmer. <laughs> Yay, thanks for Leviton. You matter this week. Um, these are all from the Decora Smart Wi-Fi second gen product line. So... Um, they will get matter support here in the near future. Congratulations, Leviton. Yay, you did it. There's one interesting note here. Uh, Levi- Leviton's uh, support page notes that Apple Home users will, uh, who are upgrading to matter will have to unenroll their devices from HomeKit and then re-enroll them in matter. So I guess that's kind of like the thing that I was running into last week, right? I think you ran into that too. Well, yeah, because so I got the uh, Aquara FP2 sensors and you set it up with their, you know, Aquara app first and then it like automatically got added to HomeKit and then I had to delete it from HomeKit, which then my home assistant found it. So it's just it's, it's weird how it auto found yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And so it just got automatically Apple ad- added to Apple Home. Like that's one thing. Mm-hmm. But like if you already have these devices in Apple Home, you got to delete them out and then you can get them back with the matter thing. So I don't know. I guess I guess it makes sense like going forward if you get a new device, drop it in with matter. If you get a new device that's not, you know, or you have some older devices on HomeKit, I guess you can leave them there or possibly upgrade them to get everybody on the same page. I don't know. Seems a little disjointed. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> that's why we have this segment every week. It's it's, it's gonna matter one day. That's right. I'll stop playing the clown music when it's not quite so funny. <laughs> 
<laughs> the clown music gets its treatment every week, though. Well, all the links and topics we discussed tonight uh, can be found on our show notes over at hometech.fm slash 444. Uh, nothing in the mailbag, I don't think, this week, but we do have a pick of the week. And this, I thought, was, you know, kind of funny in a nerdy way, but... Um, yeah, we kind of have to use this uh, SSH thing from time to time, which is kind of like a remote shell program. If you're, uh, if you remember terminals or or whatever, like uh, you have to log in. Hacker into... interface, you, you yeah, use. the old hacker interface, exactly. Well, SSH gets used a lot. Uh, if you're in Windows, you you commonly call this thing Putty. Like I guess there's a program that's really popular called Putty that everyone seems to use or love or like or whatever. There's also many, I guess it's it's built into like PowerShell. I don't know why anybody would download Putty and use it, but I guess people like Putty. And so I, like when I'm talking to Windows guys, I'm like, hey, can you SSH into this thing over here? And they're like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, can you use Putty? And they'll 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 launch Putty and get it get it loaded. It says SSH in Putty though. Does it? P-U-T-T-Y? Yeah, the option is still so when you open Putty, you have SSH and Telnet and other things. I'm pretty sure it still says SSH. Probably. Yeah, Putty, a free SSH and Telnet client for Windows. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. They're just crazy. Whoever you're dealing with doesn't know what they're doing, Seth. No, no, that's that's totally true. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Uh but anyway, uh this is a little uh a little thing. It, it it's from um let's see, Cass D Dia at tech.lgbt. Says I think about this every time I SSH, and it's got a nice little picture of a guy sitting on a computer, and it's it, at the bottom. It says remote login is a lot like astral projection, and it's got, it's got a this is an interesting illustration of him being projected onto the actual computer that is, I don't know, away somewhere through the clouds. I don't know. It's a fun little picture to look at, and uh, definitely I will think about this little picture every time I go in remote shell into a another computer. It's fun. It's kind of it's kind of like uh, like remote VR. You know, you can just VR into your other computer, but through your yeah. computer, it's like you're there, but you're oh. not magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I actually had to do this quite a bit the other day when I was upgrading our Mastodon server <laughs> for the many many time that I have to update Mastodon servers. Um, yeah, you you basically live inside of a shell because all everything is command line, and you have to get Linux to do things. And I finally got Linux to do stuff and got our server upgraded because there was a pretty bad exploit. And, you know, this is, this is, this is how you can imagine me doing this. This is me on the left here. That's our server on the right. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for show, give us a shout. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can visit hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. Well, TJ, I know you've been busy with projects. We talked about your theater project you've been wrapping up on. I mean, you got anything else going on now that you're back home? Did you get those? Yeah. Did you get those FPU twos programmed in? Yeah, I, I got them programmed. I got them set up. I haven't done too much with them. They're they're activating lights and stuff like that. Um, we also, you know, I did I did just get back from Illinois on Saturday afternoon, but we also got a new puppy that we are fostering. So the new puppy is taking up all of our time. Uh, his name is Noodle. He is a uh, beagle and something mixed, and he is the whiniest dog I think I've ever Aww. dealt with. Well, I saw a picture. He's adorable. He's, he's very yeah. he's very adorable. He is very adorable. Gets a pass for being he'll, whiny. He'll, he'll, he'll get uh, adopted very quickly. I have no doubt about that. So <laughs> that is eating up all my time at the moment. So no fun projects going on. A couple house things. I got to get the roof replaced and fix some walls and blah spend spend money on things i don't want to spend money on <laughs> yeah not tech related so. yeah i could buy so much tech with the, with roof money seth i don't i don't know if you know that i do know that i do know that i could buy like a really nice i could buy a, not not like a fancy video wall like you like you're gonna buy for your company but i could buy like a really nice video wall or like a short throw projector or like you know all kinds of stuff what about you, Seth? Do you have any fun projects going on right now? Uh, no, I've got some some like a list of things that are broken around the house that I do have to fix. Uh, one of them is the air conditioning. For some reason, Ooh. it's not blowing in in rooms correctly as it should. You know, as strong or as as um, as uh, it's not cooling rooms as as well as we think it should be. So there's there's probably something loose somewhere, and I've got to go find that. Um, which involves getting up in the attic, which involves like, I'm not, I'm not going to the attic for one thing. Like if I got to go in the attic in the middle of the summer, it's going to be for a few things. 
So I'm thinking like I should finally run a cat five or cat six, I guess at this point in time across the house for, um, you know, getting cameras mm-hmm. installed on the other side of the house that I have nothing run over there for. So I'm thinking I'm going to do that. Like that'll get done at the same time and just push that. I've got a pipe that goes that way and I can, I think I have a pool string still in it. And I can pull a new cable through and get, you know, a cat six run across while I go look for whatever is broken apart in the attic and maybe blowing cold air into the Florida <laughs> attic. Yay. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I don't know how you're, how you're not fixing that like immediately. Is it, it not, it's not that working, bad. not bad enough. Yeah, okay. it's not that like, it's, it's like just the, Florida, Florida in the summertime sucks. So without AC, I would be dead. No, we, we have AC. It is blowing. It's just not blowing like it used to. And I think I know where the problem is. I just got to poke my head up there and poke around and see like it, it may be nearby the thing, but I'm not going to poke my head up there for nothing. I'm going to get up there and do some other stuff too at the same time. Uh, because you kind of have to pick your battles <laughs> if you're going into a super hot attic in the middle of the summer. Um, and let's see. I, I Oh, I am um, not for Amazon Prime, but I did get a level lock last week. Um, it wasn't part of uh, the, the Prime stuff. It was kind of just its own deal. And I it was it was already like uh, $10 off. And then there, I think there was another $20 coupon on top of that. Right. So what did it, I'm trying to remember what it came to. You paid like 149 or something. 159. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I guess $20 discount applied in the cart. Um, and I've been kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't have the, uh, it has the keyless entry, but it doesn't have the same thing that the acquire one has the home key entry. But I don't know. I just kind of, after getting this lock on this side and being able to make sure that the doors are locked at a particular time of night, it's like, well, I'll do the front door, but I don't want, I don't want to, see it like i don't want a big blocky thing on the back of the door and the level lock affords you that right now i'm now i'm just worried because after i bought this people are like oh yeah uh those don't work with every door <laughs> so <laughs> kind, of, <laughs> kind of like oh well um we'll we'll get it in and when, once i get it in it, it's one of those things is it going to work like flawlessly and be an easy install or it's going to be something that i'm just going to bang my head against the wall and not get done do you know if that integrates with Home Assistant? Uh, well, I, I mostly use um, HomeKit for everything, so it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, as I was say, it'll, it'll uh, integrate with Home yeah. HomeKit and Home Assistant at that point. Then, so I want to get a smart lock for our back door, our back ex- or the very far exterior door. But I don't want to get a keypad because, like, I don't need to go unlock it all the time. But it would be nice to be able to control with the automation system and stuff. Yeah, it it looks like the this has been somewhat. I guess it's. You know, I'm looking just kind of randomly through their forums, and yeah, people say that they have it working with Home Assistant. So there you go. It's it's a Bluetooth lock. Okay, it should work fine. I'm excited about it. It'll it'll be one of those things that'll that'll go in and and not have any. It's not going to show any technology, right? So on the front door, I just want it to exist and be able to say, "Oh yeah, did I lock the front door?" Or at like now, I, I have this one lock itself at eleven o'clock at night or whatever. So every night, I know that the door gets locked. That'd be great. Yeah, that's a nice safety feature. I have the the van in the front door set up to automatically lock itself every night at like nine p.m. Yeah, and I I just like that. It's nice, cool stuff. So. We'll see what happens. I I uh, I was going out of town this weekend, this last weekend, and um, I I you know it would have delivered on Friday, but I'd be out of town and just sit there <laughs> outside of the locked door for you know all weekend. So I chose the um, the random Amazon day, which is Thursday. So I should get it um, in a couple of days. Well, your job is to install before next episode or next show. Oh, so, so I, I have plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the next time we record it, not the next time you release it. So you have right, less right. than a week. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if that's the schedule, if it's up to me, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try and. Get We're it. never doing the show have any again. Planned for this week, so. <laughs> well, you have you have like a month, a month and a half until we go to uh, Cedia, so it definitely has to be done before then. Mm. Yeah, we got to do Cedia. We're gonna have to do like a live episode or something there where you could just like record it and put it out. Just like <laughs> make it noisy and all that good stuff. Like I, I, I'll never forget the first the first time uh, Jason and I got together at CD to record. We were like way down, like underneath the convention center. Like they were clanging around with carts and stuff down there, and and we just sat there at this table, like at this cafeteria table that they had set up for some reason. 
And uh, we're just having our conversation while these people were driving by with carts. And man, that was that was fun. So maybe we can sneak away and go to some noisy place like that. Um, I'll have a booth. We can just sit in the middle of the booth and have a podcast. That'll be fun. Oh, yeah. That, I'm sure that'll be great. Yeah. And, and, Greg in the chat will love that. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll make you sound good somehow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. I think that's going to wrap up this week. Uh, we do want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support through our Patreon page. If you don't know about the Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support and learn how you can support home tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out here on the show, but every pledge, every single one of them gets you invited to our private Slack chat, the hub where you and other supporters of the show can make fun of TJ's audio every week. That's right so good it's so good actually last you know that it's really good on the show but you know. yeah i didn't think it was that bad but i guess you know there's some people that don't like it and it, it's probably just my voice honestly like if i heard my voice all the time i probably wouldn't like it either so it sounds great tonight too i think i think we'll be able to do something with it so. well thanks seth that means a lot coming from you <laughs> all right if you want to help out uh the show but can't support financially totally understand we just appreciate a five-star review on itunes or a positive rating in the podcast app of your choice That's going to wrap up everything on Home Tech this week. Have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Till next time.